Hello, and welcome to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's Daylight Savings Time Policy Webinar. My name is Eric Albrecht, and I'm the Advocacy Program Manager here at AASM and your host today. This webinar will feature the presentations of Dr. Adil Rishi, Dr. Beth Clerman, Ms. Jenny Burke, and Dr. Thomas Spear. We will have a brief Q&A after the panelists spoke, so please leave your questions in the Q&A and not the chat. Our first speaker is Dr. Rishi, who was the primary author of our Daylight Savings Time Statement and will be the, featured on the Talking Sleep podcast episode coming out tomorrow. Dr. Rishi. Uh, so thank you, Eric, uh, for having me. Uh, so uh, my name is Muhammad Adil Rishi. I'm uh, the Vice Chair of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Public Safety Committee. I'm a consultant here at the Mayo Clinic in Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the position statement issued by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine in favor of year-round standard time. The position statement came out a couple of months ago. Um, so let's get going. I do not have any conflicts of interest in relationship to this talk. So we all know that we switch our clocks twice a year, um, forward in the spring and backwards in the fall. And that's what we uh, call daylight savings time. Um, what a lot of people don't know is why we do it. Um, the reason is this is set by law. Um, a uh, federal statue. Uh, and um, so every second Sunday uh, in March at 2 a.m. and uh, the first Sunday on November uh, at 2 a.m. these changes happen uh, because of uh, the federal law. Um, over the years, several states have introduced legislation that would support changes to the observation of daylight savings time. Over the last few years, this, uh, this um, um, has gotten more steam. Um, although uh, this broad support for elimination of these uh, daylight savings time, uh, specifically the changes uh, between uh, standard time and daylight savings time in spring and fall, the proposed solutions are conflicting. Um, and it's important to note that uh, the, the law as it's written right now allows states to opt out of daylight savings time. And in fact, um, Arizona, and Hawaii have opted out of daylight saving time and do not observe daylight saving time currently. Um, however, moving to permanent daylight saving time would require a legislative appro approval of the US Congress. Um, so over the last year or so, the Public Safety Committee of uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine was mandated uh, with reviewing data uh, in support of or against uh, adoption of permanent daylight savings time uh, versus standard time. And, and after review of uh, the data, um, the uh, Academy uh, issued a position statement um, that the United States should eliminate uh, seasonal time changes in favor of a national fixed year-round time, and that the current evidence best supports adoption of year-round standard time, which best aligns with human circadian biology. So in the next few slides, I will review some of this data with you. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of the data, but my slides are referenced. Uh, and so those of you who are interested in reviewing the data in greater depth are welcome to look up those papers and review it. Um, so we now know that transitions between uh, standard time and daylight savings time are harmful, especially the spring transition has been associated with a lot, lot of harmful effects, uh, including inclu increased cardiovascular morbidity, um, uh, missed medical appointments and increased emergency room visits, mood disturbances and increased suicide risk at, in the in risk, at, at, in the at risk individuals, uh, fatal crashes and medical errors. Um, so um, this paper that I'm showing you here is from Manfredini and colleagues published in 2018. Uh, they reviewed all literature published uh, looking at the risk of myocardial infarction up until 2016 in relationship to the transition between standard time and daylight savings time. And what they found was that um, all studies, so the six studies that they included, all studies demonstrated an increased risk of acute myocardial infarction at the time of the spring switch. 
This next study uh, is from Chado and colleagues published earlier this year, uh, looking at the risk of uh, atrial fibrillation um, uh, at the time of switches between center time and daylight savings time. It's a single center retrospective study, um, three year worth of data. Uh, and they demonstrated that there was an increased risk of atrial fibrillation related ER visits um, um, and admissions uh, at the time of the spring transition. This next study is uh, looking at the outpatient uh, appointments uh, in Scotland, uh, five years worth of data from Ellis and colleagues published uh, a couple of years ago, demonstrating an 14% increased risk of medical appointments in the spring transition and 12% decreased risk when you go from daylight savings time to standard time. Um, this next slide um, is a 30 year worth of data from um, Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, looking at the risk of suicide um, and mood disturbances um, in the in risk at, in the at risk individuals. And what they demonstrated uh, uh, was that there was an increased trend towards increased uh, suicide, both at the spring transition as well as in the fall transition. Um, and this next slide shows that uh, claims data from New Zealand, uh, 11 year worth of data from Rob and colleagues, um, demonstrating that there is an increased risk of both roadside accidents as well as work related accidents in the few days after the spring transition. So, you know, in the interest of time, I can't demonstrate you all the data that's out there, but it just gives you a flavor of, uh, you know, some of the risks that are associated with the transition, especially the spring transition from standard time to daylight saving time. And so uh, several proposals are out there uh, looking at, you know, what, what do we do? And uh, once you get rid of the transitions, uh, uh, the two most talked about ones are either going to permanent daylight savings time or permanent uh, standard time. And there's certainly some things that can be said in favor of permanent daylight savings time. There's some evidence that there's slight decrease in crime rate and a modest overall decrease in motor vehicle crashes when you are on permanent, uh, when you're on daylight savings time. However, in terms of a motor vehicle crashes, it, uh, it, it's important to bear in mind that there is actually an increased risk of fatalities among school age children in the morning between the months of January and April. And I'll get back to that in, in the next few slides. Um, one other thing to remember about permanent daylight savings time is that we have done this before. Uh, the last time we did it was in 1973 in response to the OPEC oil crisis. Um, uh, it was introduced uh, primarily as an energy saving measure. Um, um, so we went on permanent uh, daylight savings time uh, with a plan of about 15 months uh, starting on January 6, 1974. Um, however, uh, although at the time of the, the switch, there was broad support for the transition to permanent daylight savings time, um, the support dropped uh, dramatically in the next few months. Uh, and in fact, um, we went back to, you know, standard time in October uh, of the same year uh, by an act of, uh, act of Congress uh, because it became so unpopular. Uh, one of the main reasons it became unpopular was that there was evidence of increased fatalities among school age children in the morning between the months of January and April. And uh, the, the hypothesis behind that is that these kids are traveling to school in the morning when it's dark, because that's what daylight saving time does, is it moves the social clock forward uh, so that uh, it's, it's darker in the morning for longer period of time and more light in the afternoon or evening. Um, so, you know, and some of these kids are not traveling by school bus. I mean, they are traveling, you know, on foot or, um, or b b b by a bicycle and more likely to get into trouble. Um, the other thing that uh, is probably worth mentioning is that the farmers also don't like uh, daylight savings time. Everything that happens on the farm is by sun clock and you know, the sun doesn't change when it comes up and come, goes down when we move the clock forward. And so 
uh, the work at, at the farm gets 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 uh, um, you know out of sync with uh, with, uh, with with the, with the sun clock when you move the clock forward. And so we went back to uh, to standard time uh, that fall because of these uh, these things. Um, the other thing to kind of remember is that uh, if uh, you live in a state which either has introduced legislation or in a locality that has uh, taken my years to delay school start time, adopting permanent daylight savings time would undo all the progress that has been made in this regard. Um, uh, we know that uh, delaying school start time is associated with better academic performance, uh, and also improve school attendance. Um, uh, the Academy of Pediatrics has been advocating for delaying school start time for more than a decade. Um, and, uh, you know, going to daylight savings time permanently would, would obviously undo all of those benefits. Um, so in favor of year round standard time, it's important to mention that standard time is just better aligned with the human circadian biology. Um, when you go to a daylight savings time, it creates a, a, a permanent phase delay, what has been called social jet lag. Uh, and this phenomena of social jet lag is associated with obesity, with cardiovascular disease and with depression among other things. Um, and next couple of slides, I'll show you some of that data. A lot of this data um, comes from Dr. Ronenberg, who's done a lot of work on, uh, on social jet lag and circadian biology. This particular study showing here was from 2012. Uh, where uh, Dr. Runberg and his colleagues looked at um, questionnaires completed by more than 65,000 Europeans. And what they demonstrated was that uh, social jet lag was associated uh, with obesity. Uh, this data is from the New Horn Study Cohort uh, published by Koopman and colleagues um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and what they demonstrated was that social jet lag was associated with um, um, metabolic syndrome. And this is that classic paper uh, out of Scandinavia published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, um, uh, obviously demonstrating that there is an increased risk of heart attack um, at the time of the spring switch. Uh, several studies have demonstrated this subsequently. But the reason I'm showing you this study uh, here is because the other thing that they showed was at the time of the fall switch, there's a clear decrease in the risk of heart attack in the next several days. Um, and some have, some have interpreted that as saying that the risk of heart attack possibly stays high throughout the time when we are on daylight savings time. And if that's true, that's certainly very, very concerning. Um, and so um, uh, I would um, uh, say that certainly we need more studies to investigate the effects of chronic daylight savings time on physiology, on health, and on economics. And certainly we need to understand better how eastward and west positions in time zone health affects health and safety outcomes. However, uh, the current uh, data as uh, best supposed to the mention of uh, seasonal changes in favor of fixed year round time and a change to permanent standard time is best aligned with human circadian biology. And with that, I will uh, finish. Well, thank you, Dr. Rishi. Um, that was a great presentation. Our next presenter is Dr. Beth Clerman, who is a professor of neurology at Harvard and is a member of the AASM, but is here today representing the Society for Research on Biological Rhythm. Dr. Clerman. Good morning. Thank you very much for asking me to participate in this seminar. I'm going to try and extend a little of what Dr. Rishi just said. And um, sorry, my what Dr. Rishi just said. I can't see my. Um, can you see my face, or are you seeing the star video? There we go. I'm going to try and expand a little on what Dr. Rishi just said and give you more of the science behind why we should abolish daylight savings time. I have a conflict of interest in that my significant other is the founder and owner of Chrono Sapiens and Consulting, which is a 
consulting company related to sleep and circadian rhythms, but the material presented in this lecture has no relationship to that. So to understand daylight savings time issues, you should understand that we are about to talk about three kinds of time. One is social, which is the local time. It's the time on your watch or on your computer. One is the sun time or the solar time, and one is circadian time. So social or local time is, as I said, the time on your watch. The sun time is when it's light or dark outside. I understand and we'll talk about later about the changes of inside light. And the third is the circadian time, which is related to your internal circadian clock. So you would like the three to be aligned for optimal health and safety. So the, at least social and sun times are aligned when noon is noon, social time is when the sun is directly overhead at midnight is the middle of the night, midnight. And this occurs in the center of a time zone on standard time. So social time does not always equal sun time, however. And in the next few graphs, if you look, you can see that the underlying light color gives the time zone according to, social, to sun time, and the dark are the, are the time according to social time. So you can see that the UK's is in the appropriate time zone, uh, Finland and Sweden are in the right time zone, and other countries in the right time zone, Germany is, but actually France and Spain have chosen to be in a time zone that is not exactly what they should be according to the sun time. Now what happens in daylight saving time is that everything gets shifted one time zone to the east. So it, daylight savings time is like living in the wrong time zone by one hour. And you can see now that some countries sun time is one hour off, but some countries sun time is now two hours off from the underlying sun time. This is even worse if you're a late type. So many people self-identify as a early type like a lark or a late type like an owl. There are age-related changes in this and so that younger people tend to be more late and the early people tend to be more early types. And that means their exposure to light and dark is different. So that early type people tend to have more light in the morning, which changes their circadian time and Late types tend to have more late have tend to have more light in the evening, which also shifts their circadian time. And I will get more to that to that later. But in the early days before there was electronic lighting inside, when people were all exposed pre-industrial to just the sun time, if you were trying to live on Chicago time, all three, the owl, the lark, and the dove in the middle would all be approximately on Chicago time. Once you start adding the ability to change your light dark exposure by having lights inside, the lark moves a little earlier because as I said, they tend to like morning light, but the dove and the owl move much later because late at night pushes their circadian system late. And then if you add daylight saving time on top of all of this, that means that the owl and the dove, which are most of the population are actually now two times different than what they're trying to live on. So as I've mentioned several times, light at night affects the circadian clock. The circadian clock knows what time of day it is because of light. Light is what entrains the internal clock to external time. And those of you who've ever had jet lag know that sometimes when your internal clock is out of sync with external time, you have symptoms that you don't like. You're tired when you wanna be awake, you're awake when you wanna be tired, you might have mood changes, your appetite changes, your alertness changes. And so the light is the most important synchronizer of the internal circadian clock. Light at night shifts the clock later. So I live on the East Coast. If I fly, and one day I will fly again to California or, the, or Washington, the light at night will help move my clock to Chicago, to Washington or California time. So light at night delays the circadian clock and stays awake longer. During daylight savings time, as Dr. Rishi mentioned, you have shifted the clock but not the, the social time, but not the sun time, so that people are exposed to more light later at night, and that shifts their circadian clock later. But you haven't shifted the time they have to wake up by social time, so their circadian clock is later, they stay awake later, they have to wake up at the same time, and they get less sleep. So we know that there's social, that associated with sleep loss, there's many negative effects on physiology and on safety. 
So as I mentioned several times, circadian time follows sun time, not social time. There is no evidence that during daylight saving time, people actually shift their internal circadian time to the new social time. The evidence is that it stays on sun time. I've also done experiments in blind people and totally blind people who have no light input to their circadian clock. They're also, their internal clock does not know what social time is. Their internal clock, um, what calls free runs or does not stay in trained. And of interest, uh, even within a time zone, there's gradients for east to west changes. So on the western part of a time zone, there's later sleep timing, which I'll show on the next slide. And on the western part of the time zone, there's higher rates of some kinds of cancer. There's higher rates of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and interestingly, even a lower per capita income. Now I can explain the diabetes and the obesity and the cardiovascular disease and the cancer by physiology. I'm not so sure about the lower per capita income, but that's related to the relationship of the sun to circadian time. So here's the example of sun time changing within a time zone because within a time zone, there's an hour change. And you can see within Germany, if you look at populations of towns, of towns with populations less than 300,000, People actually, the time that they go to sleep, which is what these circles are, pretty closely tracks from west to east the time of sunrise or sunset, which is what this gray bar is. If you then look at people in more industrialized areas where they have more access or they're inside more perhaps and not rural and they're mostly governed by the sun time as in farmers, you can see that as you go into larger communities, first of all, it shifts to a later time than if you live predominantly rural community and you lose this relationship between where you are in the time zone and your sleep-wake time. This also occurs across all of Europe. So here's the boundary line for the time zone difference. And you can see that people go to sleep later within each uh, time zone. And finally, as was mentioned earlier, there's a chain increase in accidents after the transition in the spring from standard time to savings time. And even within a time zone, it's worse in the Western part of a time zone than the Eastern part of a time zone. And this was just published this year in Current Biology. As Dr. Rishi mentioned, social jet lag gives us another example of when sun time and social time are different than circadian time. It's not really possible to do some experiments to look at um, controlled experiments to look at uh, saving time versus standard time. And instead, we can look at what happens under social jet lag, which is the difference in sleep timing between work days and free days. So if we assume that on work days, your, when you go to sleep reflects your social time because you have to get up at a certain time of day in order to go to work or go to sleep at a certain time of day so you get enough sleep versus on free days, it requires reflects what your internal body clock wants to be. If you're a late person, you might stay up later on a free day because you don't have to go to work the next day and you can sleep in. And therefore increased social jet lag, the difference between somebody's work day and their free day reflects a worse mismatch between social and circadian time. And that's similar to daylight savings time. What I've hopefully just explained happens during daylight savings time. And social jet lag, as Dr. Rishi mentioned, is associated with a higher incidence of depression, anxiety disorders, metabolic disorders, cardiovascular problems. Of interest, there's also increased likelihood to be a smoker and have higher caffeine and alcohol consumption, and worse cognitive performance and academic achievement. I'd like to counter some arguments we sometimes hear about daylight savings time. Saving time. One of them is that under daylight savings time, days are longer or the sun sets later. And that's not true. The day length is the same. It just shifts sun time rel relative to social time. Another thing people say is that daylight saving time is like traveling to a different time zone. And I've told you it's like being in a different time zone, but it's not like traveling because when you travel to a new time zone, the social and sun times change with you. When you are in daylight saving time, only the social clock changes, the sun clock does not change. Some people say, well, it's only an hour, and hopefully I've just convinced you about the fact that there are differences within a time zone means that even one hour makes a difference. And it's also a little bit misleading to say, well, artificial light exposure is more important than sunlight. I totally agree that artificial light exposure is more important than sunlight, well, or is as important as sunlight. 
But the issue is the combination of daylight saving time and therefore staying up later using artificial light pushes your circadian time later and makes it worse. So as Dr. Rishi mentioned, uh, permanent savings time has been tried before. It's been tried twice in the United States before, both in 1918 to just the end of World War I. And as he mentioned, during the OPEC oil crisis, where actually was shown that it didn't actually cause energy savings, even though that was one of the reasons it was supposed to. It's been tried in the UK in the 1970s and in Russia in 2011 to 2014. In Russia, there was an increase in mood problems. And as Dr. Rishi mentioned, all four times they were ended early because of unpopularity. So in conclusion, standard time, which is what we recommend, is a match between sun and social time. Daylight savings time is like living in the wrong time zone. As he mentioned, animal and plant biology follows sun time, not social time. Your dog doesn't know what time of day it is. It knows when the sun goes up. And indeed, farmers have been vocal against daylight savings time. And as I've hopefully convinced you, human biology follows sun time, not social time. And there's adverse effects when sun and social time are not aligned. And because the circadian biology of circadian time follows sun time, and this is due to the misalignment itself and associated sleep loss. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I look forward to just talking more about it later. That was very insightful, Dr. Klerman. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, coming up, we have Jenny Burke, who is the Senior Director of Advocacy at the National Safety Council. Um, Jenny, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me this morning. Um, we'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, fatigue and, and kind of bring home some of the points that Dr. Rishi and Dr. Clearman were making this morning around the implications and impacts uh, in the workplace, on the roadway, and what the National Safety Council is, is advocating for to keep people safe. So for those of you who don't know about the National Safety Council, uh, our mission is to save lives from the workplace to any place. And so a lot of our work is focused around, you know, that, that workplace space. Uh, we're America's leading safety advocate. Um, when it comes to uh, safety leadership in the workplace, we reach about 15,000 member companies and about 7 million employees. And what we do is we focus our efforts around where we can have that biggest impact. We look at the workplace, the roadway, and we focus on impairment. And that's really what we're talking about this morning is the impacts of changing time on your body and how that can be impairing. All right, so, so this morning, you know, we're gonna talk about the, uh, what, this, what this can do to you at work and on the road, the safety implications of, of, if we, of daylight savings time in the workplaces, and then what happens if we eliminate those time transitions. And so the main thing that I'm gonna focus on this morning is really how being tired because of these time transitions can impact you uh, at work and on the road. Obviously, as you've heard mentioned, fatigue is, is the result of these time changes. Your body is tired. It has to make up for these time changes. We know that fatigue is an impairment that shouldn't be taken lightly. It often is taken lightly, unfortunately, and often it's a, a badge of honor to say that you didn't get any sleep and that you're able to keep going. Um, unfortunately, though, there are some significant impacts. We know that studies have shown that sleep problems can reduce a worker's productivity by about 6%. Uh, and in addition to affecting a worker's productivity, it also, as was mentioned, increases that risk for accidents and injuries. In fact, uh, we surveyed about 2,000 working Americans around fatigue in the workplace, and we found that 43% of workers reported sleeping less than seven hours a day. That means that they are chronically sleep deprived. So sleep loss and sleep deprivation is one of the largest causes of fatigue. And, and again, some of that sleep loss can come from these time transitions. Uh, we know that uh, study after study, you've heard some of the mentions this morning, uh, show that tired employees are more likely to be in an accident and injured in the workplace as well as on the road. We found that 13% of work injuries can be attributed to sleep problems. Fatigue has a big impact on workplace safety and safety and really contributes more to to workplace accidents and errors than any other chronic health-related condition. 
Uh, we looked at a study, um, a meta-analysis study, which looks at about 27 different case studies, about 300,000 individuals. And that's where we really found that that 13% of work injuries can be attributed to what these sleep problems are. And uh, you know, fatigue is widespread. There's several causes of fatigue. We know it's not only this transition into saving time, but we do know that sleep loss, that circadian rhythm misalignment, which we've been talking about this morning, and then work or task demands uh, really contribute to this. And when you have all of those things, uh, that's when you really start to see the impacts of it. 90% uh, of America's employers in our survey that I mentioned um, actually reported uh, being ne negatively impacted by tired employees. So we understand that it, there's an impact, but we don't necessarily know what to do with it. And so we see this as being one solution. Uh, we know that employees who are uh, impacted by fatigue can cost employers more than $31 billion annually. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> Drowsy Driving Prevention Week that's coming up next week. I just wanted to, to mention that. It's a good time to remember that drowsy driving is impaired driving. Uh, we know that about half of uh, U.S. adult drivers admit to consistently getting behind the wheel when they're drowsy. And so when you're in that wrong place, as Dr. Clearman was mentioned, um, you're tired, you're not in that same, uh, you're not getting that correct sleep. That is where we start to feel uh, and start to see some accidents. About 20% of, of folks admitted to falling asleep behind the wheel at some point in the past year. And 40% admitted that this has happened at least once in their driving career. So these figures really just show, you know, how prevalent drowsy driving is and how this can impact that drowsy driving piece. Uh, around drow drowsy driving risks, I just wanted to bring this home for a minute because both uh, Dr. Rishi and Dr. Clareman mentioned that piece about those, the fatal crashes. We know that the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, which is a federal group that investigates crashes, uh, you know, the, the big large crashes, they did a study where they compiled about 10 years of their accident investigations and found that 20% of the investigations identified fatigue as probable cause, a contributing factor, or a finding in a crash. So uh, we know that the, the prevalence of drowsy driving is about 21%, and that's about 6,400 uh, deaths every year caused by fatigue. Uh, and so, you know, we at the National Safety Council want to make sure that we are educating others about fatigue. And this is one place where we really feel that we can do it. And just to sort of bring that home, uh, what does this feel like to be fatigued? Your body may not necessarily know when you're not getting enough sleep, um, or your brain may not realize it, but your body knows. Um, we, we know that driving when you're tired and when you don't have that sleep, when that circadian rhythm gets disrupted, that it can be equivalent to actually having, um, that losing two hours of sleep from a normal eight hour sleep schedule can have the same effect as drinking three beers and then getting on the road. So that is what it's doing to your body. And most people don't actually realize that that is what's happening. And so we've, you've heard this mentioned this morning, what are some of those causes of fatigue? Uh, we look at sleep loss, we look at that circadian rhythm misalignment, and then we look at work or task demands. And I think what, where we're going with this, um, with the change from uh, time transitions is you look at sleep loss because you're now staying up later or you're, you're, you're changing your schedule and then your circadian rhythm misalignment. And so those are two of the three uh, causes of fatigue which are impacted uh, directly by, uh, by this change in timing. We know, and you've heard this morning, that um, circadian rhythm misalignment uh, is, is the big thing that we're, you know, we're, we're trying to talk about here, and that humans are biologically programmed to be asleep when it's dark outside and be alert during daylight hours. And so this, this drive is released, or is, is regulated by the release of hormones in our body. And so just to kind of dig into that a little bit more, uh, uh, than my companions this morning is that period between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. when our bodies are pumping the most melatonin, telling us to sleep. So in aviation, they call this like the period of or window of circadian low. And that's when we experience the most impact on our performance and safety uh, due to that misalignment. And, and then as we age, we have greater difficulty seeing in the dark as well. So uh, a lot of different uh, pieces that go with that circadian rhythm that I, I wanted to bring out. And then uh, just to take a little, uh, a little more time around that uh, workplace piece, 
when we did that survey that I mentioned earlier, we found that 59% of night shift workers reported sleeping less than seven hours compared to 45% of their day shift counterparts. And so we know, um, you know that night shift is a problem. And so when we're looking at switching back and forth, that also creates uh, misalignment and sleep loss. The National Safety Council has uh, many, many uh, fact sheets, infographics, posters, fatigue risk management system tools that we've developed. Uh, we have uh, uh, three different white papers that we've released on fatigue in the workplace, uh, managing fatigue and causes and consequences of employee fatigue. So if you wanna know more about the impacts of how this affects your workforce, uh, I think um, potentially some into that lower per capita income, uh, probably not totally, but maybe a little bit just because of the impact on um, productivity. Uh, and and I, I would argue that that's probably one of the reasons, but not all of them. Um, we do know that fatigue can be managed and so we do have that fatigue risk management system um, tools at the National Safety Council available to, to help with this. Uh, although that we know this is, this is not going to fix these problems when our society as a whole um, is, is changing the time zone and contributing to some of these health and safety risks. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Eric and uh, thank you for, for allowing us to contribute to the discussion today. Great, it's, and it's great to have your support, Jenny, and your organization support. Um, and finally, we just have um, Dr. Thomas Spear, who is the chair of our new advocacy committee going to speak. Um, well, Eric, starting uh, my slides, I wanna thank you all for inviting me to participate. And uh, this uh, very important um, webinar, um, my role as the chair of the advocacy committee of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine is to work with uh, a lot of groups and specifically Congress uh, to uh, begin helping them set policy and bringing uh, scientific evidence to help them decide some of these things. And we have a number of things on our agenda and this is one of them. The main purpose of the advocacy committee has been to bring a group of people in our committee, as well as working with the board, to identify specific issues uh, that we want to work with. And the Sleep Research Society and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and others have worked together. And one of these has, has been the delayed uh, sleep, um, uh, delayed school starts. And we've been fairly successful at that. And in many ways, the change in uh, how we uh, do that has been uh, moving well across the country, but not as successful as we'd hope. It's a state by state, school district by school district kind of phenomena. But I think uh, changing uh, the, uh, the times, not the time zones, but the delayed, uh, delayed uh, sleep site, the, the um, daylight savings time, the standard time and back and forth, the change seems to be the most uh, critical issue. And I think that uh, the data is fairly clear that going to one specific uh, time, uh, no time changes is going to be advantageous, even though the evidence is not quite as strong as we'd like. And that would help mitigate some of this uh, issues with um, not having children go to school in uh, later and having more sleep. There's no question we are sleep deprived. As many of you may have heard that Dr. DeMent used to say that uh, great, uh, the the national sleep debt is greater than the national debt, even today. Um, in many ways, we have honored uh, him and, and we have a, a student sleep health week. It is the second week of September, which we have moved through Congress as well. So those are things we're doing in advocacy. Um, one other thing that has taken us years, but now we have already to be established and would ask others to do, and that would be uh, to ask your congressional representative to enroll, ask their representatives to enroll in the, the National the Congressional Sleep Health Caucus. Um, it's still in its formation st um, status. Uh, we have Zoe Lofgren from California is uh, the Democratic co-chair and Rodney Davis from uh, Champaign, Illinois as uh, uh, the Republican co-chair. And so this is going to be a, a, a venue where all people interested in sleep can bring issues to that group. Uh, we need as many people as involved as possible to bring these issues. 
these are going to be issues not only like what we're presenting to you now, the, the uh, going to a standard uh, time. Uh, we also have the school start. Uh, we brought in issues with regard to uh, trying to eliminate uh, the need to be pre-certification. Uh, we've, we've got bringing relief for uh, COVID uh, for so many of the programs because the, the, the world of sleep is more than sleep disorder breathing. It includes excessive daytime sleepiness, hypersomnia, uh, circadian rhythm disorders, and many of the sleep labs that I've visited over across the country as an accreditation site visitor indicates that they aren't, uh, have not, or haven't been able to, to bring this part of their uh, work into their programs, but now we're seeing an increase in th that interest and that can be uh, performed um, very actively. The issues that I think that uh, we have, there's a state, uh, there's a Senate bill by Dr. Rubio, not Dr. Rubio, uh, Senator Rubio, and there's another one that's in front of uh, the Senate uh, to go to daylight savings time. Um, I, we've, the Academy has met with some of their uh, staffers, and so there's active momentum in that area. Uh, we're hoping to meet with them further and to work with them to to give them the science behind our recommendations to go to standard time. Um, this is what our job is, is to bring the scientific evidence and the data to help them make the best decision um, across the country. Uh, we need your participation. We need to, to let them know your interest. I, I've talked to many people across the country and they, the, I think the biggest concern is the change. And I think you can build on that argument by saying, yeah, the change is disruptive. It's oftentimes a time when you see more people seeking uh, advice as to the sleep uh, problems, uh, but also it's a time for us to really uh, identify that that is a problem that is solvable. Um, and I think from a uh, sleep specialist perspective, which many of you who are listening identify that at this time uh, you see an influx of people that have adjustment problems with their um, path therapy or their insomnia gets worse where they, you hadn't seen them for a while or the people that have hypersomnia, uh, their sleep wake cycle, it gets all disrupted and they're back saying their medication's not working. You know, we're, we're seeing uh, a significant change. And most importantly, which uh, as a mental health professional myself, the changes in mood, the depression, the anxiety and suicidal risks increase. And I think that's a, something that we have to pay attention to. Uh, the sleep facilities that I visit are seeing more of this problem. And I think sleep quality and quantity uh, is, is something we have to identify and we have to move forward in, in a very um, sensitive and thorough way. And, and also the inner cities are not getting the help they need. Uh, the noise, uh, the change of the environment, the fear that we have, COVID has had a great impact on sleep facilities. Uh, and I think that we have to remember we are wanting to know more about the sleep, not just the breathing. And the more we see the breadth of our field, the better off we will be in providing the full services of a sleep disorder center. Um, but we're advocates, uh, we're out there. There's a lot of us, um, we need your support. Uh, there, you go to the advocacy page that we have available, and I think um, you should, is the slides up now there, Eric? Yes, Dr. Spear, um, I, I can take over from here. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, as Dr. Spear said, again, there, there is federal legislation right now. Um, Rubio has a bit, bill to um, extend um, daylight savings time temporarily for one year due to the COVID pandemic. Um, that piece of legislation isn't going to move um, before the time change, definitely. And again, he has another bill that allows states to go on permanent daylight savings time as well. Um, so there is interest at the federal level. We have spoke to um, staff on the Hill and um, hopefully we have a few that are listening in today that have listened to the science of our presenters. Um, and as you'll see on this next slide, that there is 
a lot of activity at the state level. Um, our recommendations are, of course, for na national legislation to be put forward um, to keep a consistent, st consistent um, standard time throughout the whole country. But you know, again, there is interest throughout the country. Um, again, I just want to point you to some of the resources on our website. So if you go to uh, aasm.org slash advocacy, or if you are on the main page, go to under the membership um, tab, there is the advocacy. Um, we have a lot of resources on there and we continuously will be adding resources. Um, and then there is a take action page, which is a good tool for sending messages directly to Congress. Um, I've created a program on there to send a message directly to Congress relating to daylight savings time and our statement. Um, you know, I, I will add the presentation that we are giving today onto it as well so that they have that information. But I encourage everyone to go to asm.org slash advocacy slash take action and fill out the tell Congress to stop the clock um, because we want to make sure that this momentum that we are seeing as far as legislation continues. Um, so, if any, so if anybody has any questions, I will go to the um, I will go to the questions at this time. So Jeff Tanner just says this would be valuable information when contacting our congressman requesting our state to change the law to standard time. Again, absolutely, we will have this, the slides available and this whole presentation available on our website. If you have any questions, you can um, email me, ealbrecht at asm.org. Um, Raymond Borney ha Ori has a question for Dr. Clerman. Dr. Clerman, have any of our colleagues at the SRBR looked at China for evidence to further support the move to year round standard time, certainly the differences between East and West. What has the largest single time zone should be a source of useful data? Uh, that's an excellent question. And there are members of SRBR trying to get that information from China. Yes. It's, so China has one time zone, one official social time zone for, I believe, five sun time zones. So um, that's an excellent question. And as I said, members are trying to get the information from China to do that analysis. Great. Um, we have a kind of a comment question from Robert Aronson. Um, this may be splitting hairs, but from a physiological standpoint, tiredness seems to be a more appropriate term to use to fatigue as a pulmonologist in intravenous. Um, fatigue to me implies an exhausted motor function while tiredness implies, implies a sleepy state. The people pictured in the talks today look tired, not necessarily fatigued. <laughs> um, I hope I don't look too tired. <laughs> Would appreciate comments. Um, And let's see, I'm just scrolling through here. Uh, another comment, turning clocks forward is associated with increased suicidality as well. Um, Thank you for the presentation. What about the focus on states? Again, I think it is important for the state legislation um, to go through, but I think as far as, you know, kind of, you know, holistically, I think we need to, you know, push for national change as well. Um, what does the panel think? So I can comment on that. I think we have to understand that um, although the state legislation certainly puts pressure on Congress to act, uh, these, uh, these legislation at the state level do not change the practice of daylight savings time. Uh, the way the law is currently written, uh, states can't opt out of, uh, can opt out of daylight savings time, but they can't go to permanent, uh, permanent daylight savings time. And for it to happen nationally, 
uh, and to avoid what happened prior to the Uniform Time Act in the uh, nine, 19, late 1960s, uh, it would require a national uh, act of Congress for meaningful change to happen. And so, and that, that's why, for example, uh, you know, um, Senate level uh, legislation that has been introduced by um, uh, Senator uh, Rubio and Scott from Florida uh, is more likely to affect change than what's happening at the state level. Uh, so yeah, I agree that state level uh, legislation is important and puts pressure, but in practical terms, probably will not change much until Congress acts. Great point. Um, so next question from David Rosen is, what is the argument for the status quo? I can imagine that the cost and logistical challenges of changing something so ingrained in our society, are there any arguments beyond that? So, so uh, again, I can I can comment on this. So, I think um, uh, you know, as as previously stated, there is some evidence that uh, the crime rate does decrease uh, when you're on daylight saving time. What's not clear is whether that that is because you know daylight saving time currently is practiced during uh, during the summer months uh, when there is more light in general. The photo period is just longer in general. Um, there's also slight uh, decrease in uh, in motor vehicle crashes. So, uh, you know, from a public safety standpoint, I think uh, the academy appreciates those two points in the the statement that was issued. However, I think if you look at the holistic uh, aspect of daylight savings time uh, and how it affects health and public safety, uh, th th there is really uh, little argument in favor overall uh, of of the status quo. Uh, most people agree at this point that uh, that switching between daylight savings time and center time is just uh, not good. Uh, I think um, it is likely that there will be a switch. In fact, uh, um, Europe has European Union has already decided that uh, they will get rid of daylight savings time next year, uh, and uh, they will allow the states uh, within the European Union to adopt uh, center time or daylight savings time, and so. Um, you know, for a year round. Uh, and so, so I think it's likely that this will happen here as well at some point. I would agree that uh, my visits on the Hill as well as talking to congressional offices, uh, that is, this is a very important topic for them to go away from the changing of time. Uh, it's probably one of the first things they bring up to you when you visit with them as some of their concerns. So there is uh, a high level of interest uh, to go away from the status quo. Absolutely. Um, so is there a potential value in abolishing time zones altogether, i.e. a universal quote, world time? Um, I would argue that's even worse because some of us would um, be on more than one. If we follow sun time, then if there's only one social time, then uh, can you imagine if we were trying to live on the equivalent of Greenwich Mean Time? Or if the people in Japan were trying to live on the equivalent of Greenwich Mean Time, if they were trying to still wake up um, when it's totally dark out, because that's when it's 7 a.m. So um, as somebody asked earlier, the Example of China is one, a smaller version of this, and we'll know the evidence from that, but I would still say that we should follow the sun and um, use approximately equal 24 hour, 24 time zones corresponding to the rotation of the earth. Thank you. So going off of that, we have another question. In additional to fixed standard time, do you recommend more time zones in the US? I think more of a policy issue, policy issue, than a scientific issue. I don't know. How you, I guess you would have half-hour time zones for. I'm not sure, how you do implement that? So I'm going to defer to the policy people on. My experience historically, when they started breaking up time zones outside of state lines, 
it was very chaotic in trying to schedule things. And there was a period of time when I lived in Northwest Ohio that part of Northwest Ohio was in one time zone. And, and when you went back to Central Ohio, it was in another time zone. This was way back in the 50s. And then when you went to Indiana, it would change again. So you never knew what time zone you were in. Uh, I was quite young then, obviously, uh, but it still was um, chaotic. So I think you got to get some social issues. And I think state lines are going to uh, be the guide, probably more so than um, one hour segments, because uh, we have so many things that are controlled by geographical guidelines that have been set by um, government. Great. Um, so we have a question. So if standard time is better, why is review in introducing change to permanent daylight savings time? And I'll, I'll start and then someone else can pick up. So um, Florida is one of the states that has voted for permanent daylight savings time. So I think it is, you know, kind of piggybacking off of their own state's efforts. Um, if you see the kind of national legislators that support permanent daylight savings time, it's because their state has moved towards that way. Um, and again, there's there, their arguments are mostly based around um, popularity of daylight savings time. People think that they like daylight savings time more than standard time. Um, does anybody else wanna pick up from there? I wanna say that one of the reasons Possibly one of the reasons people say they like daylight saving time better is that sometimes it's asked in terms of summer versus winter time. And most people prefer summer to winter. So the question can be a little misleading. I'm not saying that's the only reason, but that has been noticed in some questionnaires. Um, yeah, I can um, uh, also say that, uh, you know, uh, I think um, the academy's position is primarily should be looked at as a public health statement, right? So, um, uh, you know, um, I, it's clear of, uh, to us as public health, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, people or professionals that from a public health standpoint, uh, daylight saving time permanently would not be good. But there are certainly other aspects um, that daylight saving time affects uh, in our daily life, uh, economic effects uh, especially. Uh, and there are certainly uh, people uh, who have lobbied for daylight saving time because of the potential or presumed economic benefits, uh, one way or the other, to one industry or to another industry. And so some of the reasons for why there's been a push uh, or lobbying uh, is not necessarily because of public health, but for other reasons. Again, I think we have to present the scientific evidence and let uh, the politicians make their own decisions based on that. Uh, our opinion is is the science and uh, and stick with that. And I think you get people outside, they'll, they'll realize they're the best decision for themselves. All right, great. Well, we. We have a lot. We have a lot of questions. Um, we have run up on our time. Um, so someone asked if um, if there's a letter we can forward to state legislators. Um, I would encourage you to send the daylight savings time position statement to your um, local representative. Um, but if you need something more formal, um, I will. You know, I will create a letter that in PDF form to go on the website as well. And let's see. Someone notes that Canada is half time zones. But I think, um, again, we've run up on our time. So I'd like to thank everybody for. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their time today. We will try to answer um, questions um, later to the ones that weren't addressed. And again, the recording of this webinar will be on our website as well as the PDFs of the presentation. So I'd like to thank everybody and I'd like to thank the panelists' time and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone.